tonight on Reporting Scotland. Icy blasts lead to school and transport disruption with warnings of more heavy snow to come tonight. As drivers are told to expect hazardous conditions and delays, we'll have the latest from Scotland's Traffic Control Centre. Also on the programme, a 92-year-old nun tells the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry she didn't mistreat children at a Lanark care home. A former Scotland player who was once banned for gambling says clubs should stop being sponsored by betting companies. You know, they're scrutinising and killing off players, but then they're sitting with the billboards up with their sponsors for them. Take them, scrap the sponsors, go and find somebody else. And the autism-friendly airport experience that aims to take the stress out of takeoff. Good evening. Snow is causing further travel disruption across central and southwest Scotland this evening with a weather warning in place until tomorrow. Dozens of schools across the country have been closed and there have been a spate of road accidents. The Met Office says that much of Scotland will be affected by ice and snow until Friday evening. Katie Hunter has the latest. It's been a busy day for the emergency services as some drivers struggled in the wintry weather. Police were called to this accident in Whitburn, West Lothian, mid-afternoon. Further north, this car came off the road near Daviot in the Highlands last night. Inverness Airport was closed until midday and many flights across Scotland were delayed. The snow was forecast and gritters were out early on. Driving conditions are expected to remain challenging into this evening and overnight. We're getting feedback from the street that the temperatures are actually starting to drop now, so you've got the, the um, frozen conditions as well as the snow landing there. As I said, we've got all the gritters out there um, right throughout tonight. In fact, we've got 162 gritters that's going to be out all night gritting the trunk load network. This was one of more than 115 schools and nurseries closed this morning. The north and south of mainland Scotland were worst affected first thing. More than 60 schools were closed in the Highlands and around 20 in Dumfries and Galloway. And school transport was disrupted in the borders. We were not expecting this. On the forward-looking radar, we didn't think it would reach this far across the borders. And actually, it's had a quite a severe effect on the school closures for the day. We've had lots of children who have had to wait to be um, escorted home by alternative routes and alternative means. In some places, the snow was more welcome than others. Glenshee Ski Centre put its machines to work first thing. Back on ground level, and for most people in Whitburn, it was business as usual. Don't bother me, really. You just get on with it. Got a pair of boots. Big hat. There you go. I think people always have a moan anyway as soon as it snows, but it's just got to take it as it comes, I suppose. And with more snow and ice coming for many parts of the country, police are telling motorists to leave extra time for their journeys and drive according to the conditions. Katie Hunter, reporting Scotland. Well, for the latest on the impact of tonight's snow, let's cross to Traffic Scotland's control room and our reporter Stephen Gordon. Stephen, what was the impact on tonight's rush hour? Well, Jackie, that's what the people in this room have been monitoring. And you get a good sense of it when you look up at this bank of screens on the wall behind me. Now, they have access to more than 400 CCTV cameras. And most of those that you can see on the screen there are focused on areas covered by that amber warning for snow and ice. What they can see is pretty much what they expected to see, hazardous driving conditions. A good example of that tonight has been on the M74, which has twice been partially closed to allow the gritters to come through after a sudden dump of snowfall. Now, those conditions have been replicated across large parts of the southwest and central Scotland. So while there have been no major incidents, life been pretty difficult for motorists tonight. And looking ahead to tomorrow, Stephen, what can we expect? Well, that amber warning is in place until 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Now, we had difficulties on the road this morning and that was only a yellow warning. So people are being reminded to take, to take cognizance of that fact. They say that there are the potential for significant delays. Congestion could restrict emergency vehicles or gritters getting through. There will be gritters out there on the road, 162 of them on the trunk roads in total. But drivers are being told whether they're in that amber warning or the other large 
parts of the country which are covered by the yellow warning to take their own action, to heed those warnings and to plan their journey accordingly. Stephen, thank you. There's been a further dip in the performance of Scotland's accident and emergency departments. In the first week of January, just under 80% of patients were seen and admitted, transferred or discharged within four hours, down slightly on the previous week, which had been the worst since records began. Well, our health and social care correspondent Shelley Joffrey is here. Have these figures come as a surprise, Shelley? Not really, Jackie. I mean, when you consider flu cases that week were double what they were the week before and we were just coming out of the New Year four day weekend when a lot of GP surgeries and pharmacies would have been closed for that whole period. Those might otherwise have been the first port of call for many of the walking wounded who ended up in a &E. What is surprising though about these figures is the big increase in the number of people who actually faced a wait of 12 hours or more. 470 people across Scotland up nearly 60% on the week before. Well, now that the festivities are over, can we expect things to get better? I don't think anyone would be bold enough to make that prediction quite yet. We're obviously at the start of um, some more bad weather and we don't really know yet whether we've reached peak flu. We'll see more slips and accidents, obviously, with the bad weather. The government will be hoping that these figures are the end of a really tough period for the NHS in Scotland, where any &E departments are still outperforming the rest of the UK. Thank you very much, Shelley Joffrey. A sixth complaint has been made against Police Scotland's Chief Constable Phil Gormley. Mr Gormley is currently on leave of absence while the allegations against him are investigated. He denies any wrongdoing. Tonight, the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner confirmed it had received a referral from the Scottish Police Authority regarding a further allegation of misconduct. BBC Scotland understands the complaint was made by a civilian member of staff. An 11-year-old boy has been injured after rendering fell from a playground wall at a school in Aberdeen. The incident, which appears to have involved a mural attached to the wall, happened at St Joseph's Primary School in Queen's Road shortly before nine this morning. The boy has been taken to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary with minor injuries. A man who murdered his 71-year-old mother by dousing her in petrol and setting her alight has been jailed for life and told he'll serve at least 23 years. Former offshore worker William Kelly shouted die as Cathy Kelly was engulfed in flames. A jury heard the 42-year-old's only concern after the blaze last February was the safety of his dog. A judge described his actions in the home they shared in Kilmarnock as horrific. A 92-year-old nun has denied abusing children she cared for at Smilem Home in Lanark up to 60 years ago. The sister, who can't be named, told the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry she didn't beat children, force feed or humiliate them. A reporter, Maura Kinneborough, can tell us more. Giving evidence behind screens for anonymity, the elderly nun said she never beat the boys she looked after up to 60 years ago. She strenuously and repeatedly denied hitting or kicking them, or that she force-fed any child or humiliated anyone who wet their beds. Asked if she ever saw anyone else ever strike a child in any way during the seven years she was there, she said no, these things did not happen. She described Smilem Park in Lanark as a happy place where children had all they needed. It was marvellous, she said. The children had games, visitors, films. There was a lovely atmosphere. She denied the nuns ran a regime based on fear where children were routinely beaten and abused. She rejected specific claims she'd hit a boy with a hairbrush, kicked a child curled on the floor and beaten children when she lost her temper. The inquiry before Lady Smith has cost almost £12 million so far. It's heard nuns were not given childcare training before they went to work at Smilem. Asked why so many people had given evidence against her, she said she was shocked when she'd heard the allegations. She couldn't dream of abusing children. If she had, she'd have had it on her conscience till the end of her days. They must have really hated her to have said those things about her. She said the nuns were the obvious ones to blame for the hurt suffered by being taken from their parents. The inquiry continues. Maura Kinneborough reporting Scotland, Edinburgh. Glasgow's biggest bus operator has abandoned plans to raise fares for job seekers. Last week, First Glasgow said it would increase the price of bus tickets for unemployed passengers by 10%, prompting campaigners to warn it would make it hard for some to sign on for benefits. The company now says it's overturning that decision as it was in the best interests of its customers. 
The Unite Union says Carillion workers on the Aberdeen Bypass project still aren't clear if they will have jobs at the end of the month. The collapsed construction firm is the lead consortium partner of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. Economy Secretary Keith Brown says the contractors will be taken on by the other two firms building the £745 million road. Unite say workers were told that at a meeting they would be paid until the end of January. People were coming out, the Carillion people were, were coming out from that meeting and as far as concerned there was no sort of guarantee after the, th the money that we're going to see for the wages on the 31st of January. There's been nothing in writing to say this is where you're going, are they going to be passed over us and who are going to be eventually employing them once Carillion eventually go under. It's 20 to 7, a reminder of tonight's main story. Icy blasts lead to school and transport disruption, with warnings of more heavy snow to come tonight. And still to come, Gregor Townsend names his first Six Nations squad. He says there's no reason Scotland can't win the tournament. A Scottish Conservative MP says ministers in London should not underestimate the depth of disappointment that changes to the EU withdrawal bill haven't been made yet. MPs will vote shortly to send the legislation to the House of Lords, where ministers say the changes, which affect powers to the devolved governments, will come. Our political correspondent Nick Ardley can bring us up to date. St Pancras Station in central London. This is where trains from Brussels to the UK end up, and a useful place to remind ourselves what the row over the withdrawal bill is all about. A significant number of powers will be coming back from Brussels when we leave the EU too. More than 100 of them cover the Scottish Parliament's competencies. It seems likely some will be held in common frameworks where Westminster and Holyrood both have a say, but some will be going straight up the road to Edinburgh like trains in there at King's Cross. All Scottish parties agree the withdrawal bill needs changes. The problem, they've not agreed how yet. So with the bill back in the Commons this afternoon, there were no government amendments as had been promised. What there needs to be is an agreement between the UK government and the devolved administrations and without that agreement it is impossible to replace Clause 11. The government had plenty of time to have resolved things by this stage um, and that is why there is such a deep degree of distrust and suspicion about what the government's intent is here. And opposition parties think there's a problem of accountability. The government said that the elected MPs would be able to debate this. Instead, political appointees and hereditary peers who are there as an accident of birth are going to have a greater say over this than the Scottish Parliament has. And that's not right. Labour will force a vote this evening, trying to get through their own changes they believe would protect devolution, urging the Scottish Tories to back them. They are going to allow this bill to pass basically to the Lords unamended and we are saying stop, don't do that, get behind Labour's amendment, vote for our amendment tonight and make sure that we can protect the devolution settlement. And despite their concerns, the Scottish Conservative MPs are set to back the government tonight. This is a really complicated part of the bill and what's important is that the Scottish and UK governments continue to talk to each other and find an agreed form of words that commands both of their support. That's taking longer than we wanted but it's better to do it right than rush it. The final destination of those powers continues to be discussed. When they are laid down in law, how more delays are avoided is still being figured out. Nick the Reporting Scotland, Westminster. Well, let's go to our parliamentary correspondent, David Porter. David, there seems to be some genuine disquiet about how the UK government is handling this. Jackie, the vexed question of Brexit and how Brexit will impact on the devolved administrations, principally in our case, Holyrood is being discussed in the House of Commons as we speak now. And it, there is a row brewing tonight, and it basically centres on the fact that the UK government has not brought forward any changes or, in the parliamentary parlance, amendments to the legislation. Everyone agrees, as far as devolution is concerned, that changes will have to be uh, brought forward to make it work properly and to improve uh, the bill. Last week, the Scottish Secretary, David Mundell, announced that they would not take place in the House of Commons, but instead they would take place at some point in the future in the House of Lords. Now, opposition MPs have been very critical of this. They say it is wrong that archbishops of the Church of England and other unelected politicians will be able to have 
a say on what happens in Scotland when elected MPs, including those from Scotland, will not. And we saw a flavour of that from a Conservative MP for Stirling, Stephen Kerr. He said that the government should not be under, uh, underestimated in any way the, the depth of disillusionment about what had happened. He finished his remarks rather pointedly to his own benches, saying that it was too late for the UK government to make amendments in the House of Commons, but they could make amends. Now, Labour will try and capitalise on this by forcing a vote on the issue uh, this evening within the next few minutes. It is unlikely that that vote is going to be carried. But I think ministers should be left under no illusion of the annoyance by, from MPs, not just from Scotland, at the way this has been handled. Thank you very much, David Porter at Westminster. A woman has told a court that her then-husband was taken from their home by a man he worked for before she was told, you are divorced now. Christina Anderson was married to James Keith, who alleges he suffered at the hands of members of the McPhee family. Robert McPhee and his sons James and Stephen, along with John Miller, deny 30 charges against them, including slavery and violence. An MSP is hoping to change the law to have sprinklers installed in all new build social housing in Scotland. Labour's David Stewart has launched a consultation on a member's bill to make sprinklers mandatory. Inquiries following the Grenfell Tower tragedy showed that hundreds of housing blocks in Scotland don't have fire suppression systems. The Scottish Government said sprinklers were one of a number of measures being considered in an ongoing safety review. Police are growing increasingly concerned for the welfare of a Finnish tourist who's been missing for a week since visiting Edinburgh. 38-year-old Rena Shawgrin took a tram to the city centre on Tuesday night and was last seen in York Place after 10 o'clock. She's five foot three inches tall and was wearing dark trousers and a blue cardigan. We're concerned because it, what's happened here seems to be totally out of character for her. We speak uh, regularly to her, her family and um, they're telling us that this is most definitely out of character. What we know is that earlier on that day at the airport last Tuesday, she bought a ticket to go to Amsterdam, but she didn't board that plane. A former Scotland footballer who was banned for breaching betting rules says the game must stop taking sponsorship from gambling companies. Ian Black's call comes as the Football League negotiates a new deal with Britain's biggest betting firm. He says gambling in the game is rife. David Curry reports. You may remember Ian Black as a player with Rangers, Hearts and Inverness, or as the first to be punished for breaking Scottish football's rules on gambling. In 2013, he was fined £7,500 and given a 10-game ban. I was made an example, for sure. Um, you know, I got hit hard. Nobody will ever be able to cut it out. Nobody whatsoever. Um, and it's bad. But football players get this money and they put it on, they win money. They get, it's, it's a buzz, it's a buzz for the Joe public. Um, and it'll never stop. They can try it. And they're trying, uh, but it'll never stop. People will get caught here, there and everywhere. Although Black was the first to be punished for betting on football, it's not just players who've been caught. Last year, Annan chairman Henry McClelland was fined £3,000 and Aberdeen director Duncan Skinner was fined £1,000. The Scottish FA says it has clear rules in place prohibiting gambling, which apply to players, referees and directors. In addition, we have delivered comprehensive gambling education workshops to all 42 SPFL clubs and academies. But the nation's three major competitions are sponsored by betting companies. The League Cup by Betfred, the Scottish Cup by William Hill and the Scottish Professional Football League by Ladbrokes. That's crazy. Um, but is that because... Scottish football's people were saying we're dying to death that nobody else would sponsor them. Let's approach a betting site, they'll sponsor us. So, no, they, think they have got a cheek taking money for betting sites for sponsors and then doing players um, for, for, for betting. The SPFL says significant investment by bookmakers in recent years has benefited all 42 clubs and supported the growth of Scottish football. There is a clear and sensible distinction between the rules applied to those who can influence the outcome of a game and fans betting responsibly. With the SPFL hoping to agree a new sponsorship deal with Ladbrokes later this week, Ian Black's call is unlikely to be heeded. David Curry, reporting Scotland. 
Gregor Townsend says there's no reason Scotland can't win the upcoming Six Nations for the first time in nearly 20 years. The head coach named his squad for the tournament today. And as Andy Burke reports, there are some new faces. Since the Five Nations expanded to six in 2000, Scotland have never won the title. As he prepares for his first tournament as Scotland head coach, does Gregor Townsend believe his side can create history by finishing top of the table this season? I don't see why not. Um, if every team goes into this championship believing they can win, uh, you, it's the whole reason we're here. Um, we've got to set high standards, high ambitions for our team. Uh, we believe in them, but we also know the, the hard work that has to go in to, to make that happen. Townsend has named a 40-man squad for the tournament. Injuries have limited his options in the front row, with the uncapped props Murray McCallum and Darcy Ray included. Scott Lawson hasn't played for Scotland since 2014, but comes in to add some test experience. Number eight David Denton also returns. So too does Greg Laidlaw as one of four scrum halves. Stuart Hogg should shake off recent injury problems to be fit for the opening match away to Wales. But if he doesn't make it, the young Edinburgh fullback Blair Kinghorn could push for a first cap. It's a squad that everybody who really is standing and fit is included in, including players like Greg Laidlaw, who hasn't played since October. So it's a case of whoever's fit is in this squad, because it's a training squad. Let's not forget that. Despite the return of long-term skipper Laidlaw, the captaincy remains with John Barclay, who has carried the responsibility impressively in the past year. Greg obviously hasn't played for um, around three months now, uh, so that's a big part of why he's not named as captain, but also the, the fact that John has done such a good job. Um, so if and when Greg comes back to full fitness, and we, we really hope it'll be next weekend, uh, we'll have two players in the squad that have captained the team very well in the last few years. The Autumn Internationals are often described as peacetime rugby. The true test starts in Cardiff on February the 3rd. Andy Burke, reporting Scotland. Organisations are being urged to do more to support people with autism. It comes as a leading charity recognises the work Edinburgh Airport has been doing to help support passengers on the autistic spectrum. Here's Lisa Summers. Noisy, unpredictable, confusing. For someone with autism, an airport can mean sensory overload. That's why seven-year-old Ryan and his mum Kim are taking advantage of additional support. Right, let's go. A specially trained member of staff escorts them through the airport journey, fast track through security, and avoiding the frenetic duty-free. That's to avoid all the bright lights, all the lots of people, all the noise. The whole experience was just a bit overwhelming for Ryan, so we tended not to travel that often. Once I heard about the special assistance um, and the help that they give us, we travel a lot more. Edinburgh is Scotland's busiest airport. The company says it makes commercial sense to make it user-friendly for everyone. Most people find airports a bit stressful. You're always worried about whether there's going to be a queue, you're going to worry about whether you're going to miss your, miss your flight. We all do. And of course, those that find busy spaces difficult or challenging, those that find something uh, unusual out of the ordinary, then that's a double whammy. So it makes perfect sense for us to go that extra mile and make sure that those that need a little bit extra help get it. One in every hundred people in Scotland has autism. The National Autistic Society says some organisations are doing well, but Scotland is falling far short of being an autism-friendly nation. Two-thirds of autistic people and their families say that they feel socially isolated, and 27% of those people have been asked to leave a public place because of how other people have responded to their autism. It's absolutely vitally important that people become much more understanding um, of, of autism. Back in the departure lounge, and Ryan's getting ready for his favourite part of the journey. I like going through the gates. I like going through the gates and going in the airplanes. Hi. A problem-free start to the much. holiday can mean it's easier for the whole family to sit back, relax and enjoy the flight. Lisa Summers reporting Scotland, Edinburgh. High five. Yeah. Yeah. See you when we come back. Have a lovely time. Bye. Bye. Oh no, the moment you've been waiting for, it's the weather. Jackie, thank you. Hello there. Certainly some wintry weather around for many of us today. We saw 28 centimetres falling at Estelle Mule. That's getting on for a foot. But of course, many areas not seeing anywhere near that amount, but still significant disruption.
And tonight we have an upgraded amber be prepared warning from the Met Office for the risk of snow and ice across many central and southwestern parts of the country. You can see here on the chart over the next few hours, so these roads could well be affected, but uh, as well as these smaller roads nearby too, very difficult conditions, but come sort of midnight, most of that band of heavy snow pulls away. Elsewhere, dry, clear, cold and frosty, and then another band of wintry weather pushing in. So really the worst of the snow over the next few hours, but remaining wintry overnight, remaining cold, frosty and icy. And although the amber warning runs out tomorrow morning, the lower yellow warning with us from now right through until Friday, so we're not out of the woods. Wintry weather will continue through the course of tomorrow, much like today in the form of snow showers, rain showers on the coast, but there will be some sunshine out with them, particularly across the parts of eastern and northeastern Scotland but it will be cold. And if you get a heavy shower or two where you are, there could well be some difficult conditions on the roads, drifting on hills and high ground. And once again, cold, two, three, four Celsius, add on the wind, feeling bitter. And with passing showers, the temperatures will fall away. Best of the sunshine, Angus, Aberdeenshire, perhaps Murray, although a few showers in towards the north coast here later on in the day. Elsewhere, frequent wintry showers, much like today, uh, throughout daylight hours. And then tomorrow night, the next system arrives, this deepening area of low pressure working its way in off the Atlantic, likely to bring a spell of heavy snow for some. So to end the afternoon tomorrow, still a number of wintry showers around, and then that system starts to edge in off uh, the Atlantic through parts of Kintyre, Ayrshire, across the southern uplands, and that snow probably fringing in towards the central belt. But this time yesterday, we were expecting it a whole bit further north, so there is still some uncertainty on its exact track, but where that snow falls, likely to cause some disruption. And that low pressure rapidly deepening, it could well yet become a named storm. However, moving through quite quickly, so by Thursday morning it's gone, but there will be a lot of snow on the roads first thing. And then for Thursday itself, we're back to wintry showers, far fewer than today and tomorrow, some sunshine out with them, breezy at times, and once again, feeling cold, if not bitter. That's the forecast for now. Thank you, Christopher. And on that theme, a reminder of tonight's main news. Snow is causing further travel disruption across central and southwest Scotland. Tonight, police say the southbound M74 is closed near Abington. Dozens of schools have been shut in the Met Office, says that much of Scotland will be affected by ice and snow until Friday evening. And the government has ordered a fast-track investigation into what went wrong at the failed construction company Carillion. The company went into liquidation yesterday after running up huge debts. One industry body estimates that 30,000 companies are owed money. We'll be back with an update after the 10 o'clock news. Until then, from all the team on Reporting Scotland, good evening.